great, and it looks like we are live. Um, hi, I'm Daz Greenwood, um, a scientist at the MIT Media Lab and one of the co-chairs, and happy to be a co-host of next week's World Wide Web Consortium Blockchain Workshop to talk about prospects and possibilities for standards with a blockchain. Um, and uh, uh, with me is um, co-chair um, Daniel uh, Buckner, who um, I wanted to introduce to uh, maybe just provide a little bit of an update of um, where things are, are at now with the conference planning. And um, I know we had a program committee call last week, which uh, unfortunately I wasn't able to join. And maybe if could you maybe just bring people up to speed a little bit on where things are at with the um, schedule, and then soon we'll get to uh, one of our um, program committee members and um, someone who'll be presenting, I think, on um, on one of the topics. Um, and so uh, I'll do uh, that introduction in a moment. And uh, Daniel, take it sure. away. Yeah. So last week we talked a little bit about um, you know everyone being invited. Uh, a last call to make sure registrations were in. Um, we also took a look at scoring the, the requests for um, speaking. So those were tabulated uh, by, by you, Daza. And over the weekend, um, and just, just yesterday, we, we were able to actually pare that list down. Um, and I think we have a full rank sort of list of the topics of interest. So that's, I think that's going to help inform basically, you know, the layout of, of the talks. Um, but those people, you know, we said we had room for at least 20 to 25 uh, minimum during the official hours of the workshop. Um, and I'm sure that we can get pretty much everyone on the list if we started including, um, you know, off social time, you know, after the break at 5 p.m. the first night or whatever that is. Um, we could accommodate that at some other location. So... Um, yeah, I, I think we, we made good progress there, and you know we have a clear sense of what we're going to be discussing. Okay, great. Um, and so, speaking of what we're going to be discussing, um, I wanted to take the opportunity um, with this hangout to start to set the table a little bit with respect to the the topics. Um, and so. Um, as you said, there was um, ratings and rankings, um, and um, you know, one of the topics that came out pretty pretty strong, I think, was yours, Daniel. Um, and then we're also going to hear about security uh, in a moment. And um, but what could you get us started by just describing um, you know, what it is that that you proposed? Um, you know, the people reacted so well to with the, with the ratings and. And you know how you could see the, this approach toward identity um, ripening eventually into potentially a, something that could be standardized by the W3C. So, like, what is the problem statement, and what is the um, approach to standardization on blockchain that, that you're proposing? Yeah, so I, I I think you as you stated, you could see through the rankings, you know, the proposal that I had as well as other people, it's, it really lines up around identity, and you know. It really takes over kind of those top few rankings, and I think what's important there um, is understanding why it's so so important to W3. Because as a standard that's very personal to the user, um, it's it's important that we we hit on identity in the browser because it's a user agent, right? And what we're talking about is agency. And so what's really unique about the blockchain in this sense is that for the very first time really effectively in history. We've had a distributed system that allows ownership of an identity, but then can also be the source of indices for those identities. Um, and one source that you can look at with, you know, and securely know that you're, you're, you're finding the right identity, you're finding the right person that matches that identity. Um, and we just really haven't had that before in a decentralized um, user sovereign way. So I would say that when it comes to what what is what do we standardize? Well, you know, I don't think you actually have to have awareness of all these the inner guts of every blockchain to do that. And I think folks like Blockstack have done a really good job of sort of taking care of that in an application layer that I would liken to an implementer's layer. You know, everyone may implement focusing and inputs slightly differently in code, but if the output is recognition of an of an identity that's tied to a public private key um, that you look in one place for. Um, you can have that other layer do the rest of the work for you. So, I think that's I think that's the crux of what what we'd like to see um, the body uh, huddle around and understand as a possible standards opportunity. 
And it really unlocks a ton of stuff for uh, the other standard substandards that are within W3 that might touch on security, privacy, um, you know, a whole host. Got of it. Um, and it actually looks like we're joined by um, Marta. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's Marta. Hi, hi, Marta. Hi. Could you uh, introduce yourself, please? Uh, I'm from Blockstream. Um, I uh, I've been uh, working on uh, the privacy of blockchain, and I'm the security architect of um, uh, of uh, in Blockstream, working with Christopher Allen, uh, and. Uh, Working a bit on like identity on blockchain and applications of uh, blockchain uh, other than Bitcoin. Great, and um, so um, I had had um, a um, sort of a form to uh, for folks that wanted to talk about proposals or problem statements, um, and. Um, um, I knew that Daniel was had something to say, and uh, so did um, Shinichiro. Um, I just, I maybe I didn't check the form um, enough, or maybe you came in through a different channel. But I want to check: w was there something that you wanted to propose by way of a prospective um, standard or problem statement um, as part of the hangout, mm -hmm. or was it more you wanted maybe just a chance to discuss and feedback uh, or something else? Okay, so I would like to propose one thing about the security and trust. And so on the web-oriented blockchain standards, we should be aware of trust of each entity and node. The, the trust comes from the technology components we used, operational environment and operational policy of each node. Sharing this information about the trust among the, the blockchain-based web services is needed to establish trustable services over blockchain. At the W3C, the possible standardization items are uh, the ontologies, analysis framework, interfaces, so message format and protocol. I think it needed both for nodes and client. And W3C needs collaboration with external experts on security and trust. It may include other security-related standards and organizations like uh, so CFRG in IRTF and so group of security experts like uh, Mozilla Foundation. So uh, the possible uh, discussion topics as uh, which organizations are appropriate and how to establish liaisons and invited experts. And so WCC also needs communication with external research communities. And we should also discuss on joint work with WebCrypt, Web Application Security, and Web Authentication. This is, there are the ex existing activities in WCC. Yeah, I actually agree with that. So and I think that's what, when we talk about identity, uh, it really does hit on all those things. And you know, in, internally at, at Microsoft, I know there was like, there was a bit of, there was a tumultuous period where, you know, we people were trying to understand how this fit into a lot of work that was longstanding, like FIDO and web authentication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, at first, it looked like, oh, or this thing was going to come in and somehow disrupt everything that was going on. When really, I think a lot of those specs can benefit here because all we're introducing is the idea that there's this place that has the source of truth of, of identity tokens, and then they link to identities however they choose. And as long as we can inform the browser where to look. And, and how to receive that data, it can then plug into existing standards yeah. like the web auth standard, FIDO flows. Those are, a lot of those are, you know, web auth is pretty generic. It can be modded to, 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 to accommodate this. And then things like FIDO are, are more almost flows. So um, I, I don't think any of those go away. It was interesting. I, I'll point out we, we talked to uh, a company, Case, which makes form factors for key security in the in the um, Bitcoin space and for authentication stuff like that. They have this interesting new form factor that they're going to be putting out uh, pretty soon this fall sometime. And we started talking about auth flows with them and what we could do with this identity layer. And when you pair their form factor with with a system like this, we started getting into all sorts of new territory where someone could walk up to an untrusted computer. Um, mm -hmm. with a browser, yeah. and they could essentially use this form factor and just touch a machine 
and instantly be asked if they'd like to log in as a guest session for Twitter, if they're like on a Twitter website. Um, they don't type any passwords. It's implicit that they're logging yeah. in, mm -hmm. time-bounded. Like all these interesting things become possible, and that has to feed into security standards at some point. Good. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, what do you think would be the what would be the most fruitful aspects of security um, that we could begin to get our minds around at the workshop? Um, and so, you know, some of this is a little bit um, complicated by the fact that we're dealing with a fast evolving, you know, kind of early stage technology with blockchain generally in the new yeah. market. And so I wonder, like, what would be the best level of abstraction and sort of you know, approach um, to size and scope um, security as part of a potential standards conversation in view of um, in view of the moving pieces okay so my so my opinion is that uh, so as you know as you said that uh, the technology itself is so rapidly growing going that uh, so I think that as current technology is uh, not much enough for from the security perspective but uh, so I so from the so double double three C perspective, so we can discuss about uh, how to share the information about the security or vulnerability, and how we can uh, convince the trust of the services. Yeah, one one really specific way to do that, you know, so when we talk about these identities, right? Just imagine that you have an identifier, yep. let's say Dan .id, yeah. and I can look that up in a in a central place, and I can say, okay, it's it's out there, it's decentralized, but it's, I have this indice. So Dan.id, here's the profile that goes along with that. Yeah. Here's the, the identity data that's public. If yeah. I get if I get an attestation on that profile, like two ident yeah. identities, myself and Daza, we've come together and we've attested to something, and I present that to a website with that attestation, which is essentially just a signed piece of data yeah. that has been signed by our two private keys. Um, it would be nice if the browser... Um, in a standards way with like one function, I could go retrieve one of those attestations, run it through the function and say, was this actually signed by these two identities that it's claiming? And I put in maybe the string daza.id and dan.id and the browser is then able to resolve with some of the things that might be yeah. in web crypto already, yes, this, this is in fact, um, you know, this is in fact attested by these parties. That would be like a really specific thing that we could add. Hey, you know, and just um, picking up on that, um, uh, I, I noticed, um, uh, Shinicharo, that you had identified CP and CPSs from the IETF as uh, one possible example of how the sharing of information. Okay, okay, but so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you know that the CP or CPS is a so framework, so trust framework for so certificate authority, but so we can start uh, that uh, considering uh, about the uh, so trust framework for blockchain. That's uh, I think that the uh, identity problem is a uh, so good example, and so certificate authority problem is a good example, and we can start the discussion from that. Yes, and uh, um, so thank you. I wanted to highlight. I thought that was great. You know, I'm yeah. glad that we're having an opportunity to share some ideas before we actually yeah. get there cold. Yeah. Um, for me anyway, about thinking about what could be standardized on blockchain. It's a new question. Um, it's not had a lot of treatment before. and um, You really gave me something to think about from the IETF certificate policy and certificate mm -hmm. practice statement. For those mm -hmm. of you who are should be thankful you're uninitiated into that um, ar somewhat arcane set of PKI standards. And what it is fundamentally, as um, as we just highlighted, is a way to in a standard way, describe um, some business, but mostly legal and technical um, um, aspects of how a certification authority is, like minting a certificates and enrolling people, and um, what what crypto it's using, um, you know, how yeah, it deals yeah. with um, revocation list and things like that. That would be the type of stuff that would we'd have to communicate for what Daniel's suggesting, uh, which is yeah. well, eventually someone had to uh, re revoke or kind of migrate to a new key due to a compromise. You know, in principle, people that have added attributes to their old, um, you know, public key um, could find a way to agree that here's the new public key associated with a re-key yeah. private key of this person. Yeah. But how they do that is still up in the air, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, commercial practices and, you know, standard approaches. And so I could imagine beginning to think about how to communicate, um, you know, uh, okay. you know, things like migrations and transition points mm -hmm. and, you know, life cycle events 
yeah. would make a lot of sense, and it certainly it has a security, a heavy security dimension. You know, um, because that's one of the places that when there's a transition, where things can be most vulnerable. After all, so I see, by the way, that we've been joined by our erstwhile chair and mm -hmm. convener, Doug, um, of the W3C, and I just wanted to say welcome and also um, ask you, you know, if you, uh, Daniel did the um, service of at a high level just saying that we're, we're beginning to hone um, topics and format issues but was there any mm -hmm. other announcements or updates that you could um, share or anything else about um, the workshop um, it, please do uh, and welcome. okay thank you that's great um, so uh, just to, actually just to uh, briefly talk about what you or to touch on what you guys were just talking about rather um, the uh, a lot of what you were saying is blockchain related stuff, and, but in terms of whether that's something that would be of interest or would be relevant to um, W3C standards, which of course are only a subset of web standards and, and internet standards, you know, I think finding the intersection there, finding out what would need to be mm -hmm. done from the web side, from the client side web client client-side aspect, uh, that's really where I'm hoping the sweet spot is for the workshop itself and for anything good to do with W3C going forward. It could be that, uh, you know, there's there's lots of forums to, to discuss these things, but if we're going to be talking about standardization in general, uh, it, it needs to include more than W3C, and so that might be something we try to do going forward is to find out which, which pieces fit where uh, and how to coordinate between those different organizations or uh, or, or projects in order to make sure that the, the different pieces are not interoperable. Yeah, one uh, of the in interesting things with that I, I always had a question on. This is this maybe Doug knows this. Um, the intersection between semantic data structures and validation of those structures. So I know that you know in some places in the web there is loose validation of certain data structures that you form in HTML or other like microformats. And I'm curious, like with this blockchain identity stuff that we're going after, the folks in Microsoft now understand that, like, a, probably the largest piece of this whole puzzle is actually getting everyone to speak the same language when it comes to your identity. You know, I, I can describe a couch object in one way, but if I describe it in one way, and you know, everyone else has a hundred different ways of describing it, it's not going to be able to be shown in a browser or in an agent very yeah. well um, and predictably. So I'm curious about how that works. Like, do we have data format um, verification standards currently? Like, um, a section for that or? Well, so that's a complicated question, um, and there's a lot of different pieces to what you mean by validation. Um, there, I, there is something called JSON LD, yeah. which is mm -hmm. part of the sort of I guess the semantic web stack, more of the modern aspect of the semantic web stack, and uh, and and that's there's some core there, there's some Coordination is the wrong word, but there's there's some overlaps between that and what schema.org is doing, for example. Uh, and so, um, uh, depending on how we want to mark things up and how we want to interchange things, there's lots of different ways of going about this. But um, one of the things that W3C does is that we focus on testing. So we have defined formats in the past, and we focus on uh, basically regression testing and automated testing for those resources to make sure that uh, people are following along the right schema. There's also, what we're, what we're using actually for validation of these things is uh, a variation on JSON schema. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably any interchange message would be in JSON and optionally in JSON LD. Um, that's not required, but some people would like that. And then uh, in terms of validation, you could look at it from the point of view of tests. You could look at it from the point of view of specifications to make sure that people um, are on the same page about what are the useful parts of of a of a schema and how and of a of a of a data format and how to uh, how to coordinate with others on that. And then there's also things like services that we could stand up like. Uh, a validator, just like people can, can validate their HTML, you could validate your uh, your schema 
uh, you could validate your the output from your your, uh, your API or from your your uh, implementation and see where it's predictable and where it's not. And, and I agree, interoperability, predictability is actually a really big aspect of interoperability. Um, and so we can coordinate on uh, um, a lot of different aspects. I the, the data area is actually sort of a different part of W3C than I've normally worked in. Um, and I and there's and there's different there's different organizations within or not organizations, but different different uh, focuses within W3C. Um, and there's the data part and then there's a client side web part. And those two don't overlap very much, but it might be that blockchain could benefit uh, from some aspects of both of those. Mm -hmm. um, Going back to Daz's original question, I apologize for the description. Um, uh, by the end of the day today, I will have, I think, the final list for um, uh, the, of the attendees. Uh, when I say final, you know, that's there's an asterisk next to that because uh, there will be people who don't show. There will be people, even though they verified, there will be people who show up thinking that they verified that we never heard from. There will be uh, maybe even people who show up uh, at the last minute and say, oh, I heard about this workshop. Can we come in? Um, so the ultimate list will be in the workshop report that we produce after, uh, after the workshop. Um, but uh, the, by the end of the day today, I'm hoping to have uh, the, uh, the final schedule, or at least some form of the final schedule, uh, up. And I think... The most notable thing is that in our discussions about the schedule, um, we decided that um, identity and provenance are two key underlying ideas that are going to be touched on in a lot of different aspects of blockchain. And so we're going to try to put those on day one so we get those out of the way so that any other things that... Uh, that would touch on those, we don't have to defer those conversations. We can already have had the conversations about the ideas of entity, identity and provenance, and uh, and that will serve as a backdrop for the rest of the day. In terms of structure, here's what we plan. We're going to have a keynote by uh, uh, Arvind from Princeton, and he is uh, uh, an expert in these areas, and I'm uh, very much looking forward to him uh, to his, his discussion, or his talk. Um, at, uh, and we're going to have a little bit of W3C things, uh, some things around how the workshop itself is going to be scheduled, um, and also about the backdrop of existing technologies that W3C is going to be working on. And then we're going to go into lightning talks, and the, the basic structure is a set of lightning talks on a general topic, and then um, a set of breakouts where people explore those individual topics. So... Uh, it, Different tables will be talking about different things, and so and then after we discuss those, um, those are going to be facilitated by the individual uh, organizers of that topic, and then we're going to have, hopefully, we're also going to have a scribe for each of those things as well. A scribe is just somebody to take notes, and then uh, we'll come back to the plenary session after each breakout, and people will report back on the results of uh, the workshop. Uh, sorry, of their breakout, and uh, and then we'll rinse and repeat. We'll just keep doing that that same structure. On the second day, we're going to have um, a uh, a summary around three o'clock. We're gonna have we're, we're gonna start wrapping things up around three o'clock, and or two thirty three o'clock. We're gonna start having summaries of the zeitgeist of the whole workshop, and then um, after three three thirty. We're going to have more of an open session, just general, just open talk. Um, uh, I know some people have to leave uh, before that time to get back to Europe in time, uh, but uh, there'll be some of us left behind, and we're going to formally end at 3:30, but we're going to have a loose discuss discussion till from 4:30 to uh, from 3:30 till uh, 5:30. Um, that's the sort of the structure of the workshop, um, and. Uh, uh, block, uh, Blockstream has actually uh, been very generous and provide, they're providing a, um, uh, a graphic facilitator. And so the graphic, or the gra a graphic scribe, rather, 
And so this person is going to be listening to the plen all the plenary sessions and making diagrams and other things to help us sort of uh, come to a shared understanding, uh, other images to help us come to a shared understanding of what we are, uh, what we're trying to do and what we have talked about. And then those, those things will be part of the workshop report as well. We'll sort of int integrate those images in to let people get a sense better of, of, of what it was like to be at the workshop and sort of the thought process that went into things. Great. Thank I you. I hope that wasn't... Um, no, that was very good. Um, I just want to recognize um, um, Shinichiro. Um, first of all, thank you for contributing uh, the yeah. idea and joining us. And I'm aware that you're timing out um, now about 3.30 Eastern time and that you need to go. <coughs> so I just wanted to recognize that you, uh, whatever, didn't lose your signal or kind of get bored. <laughs> but anyway, I understand you're leaving. And, and also to genuinely say, very grateful for the contributions, the thoughtful contribution you made. It's certainly going to help me as I get ready for the workshop to start to okay. have a chance to digest and think through what we'll talk about. Okay. So I look forward to seeing you back at the lab next week. Thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, great. Okay. And um, I, I believe that Marta um, would like to say a few words, too, on an idea. Um, and let me just check to see, uh, Marta, if you can hear us uh, right sure. now. You're great on mute. And is uh, is this good timing? Um, could, do you yeah. want to? Yeah, great. I'll uh, I'll try being uh, quite brief. Uh, I'm actually on Prince Edward Island right now, and like in the middle of nowhere, so my internet might be pretty flaky. Um, so bear with me if you don't if you can't hear me. Uh, this is an idea that I've been discussing with um, both uh, Doug and some other people. Uh, it connects to identity, it connects to a bunch of other things. Um, basically, the thing that I'm very tempted with uh, is, or, or a thing that I've realized is that uh, something that has not been possible before introduction of blockchain technology uh, is tracking to your private data when you go online. Uh, once you go online in today, today uh, you completely lose control of your private data. It's you. You just it submit forms. They disappear. It can no longer. You can claim ownership of your data. With blockchain, however, it would be possible to somehow color or watermark data and say, this piece I have shared with this third party, and the blockchain technology and the hash uh, uh, hash function and uh, you know ha hash addresses and all of that, we could track which information or like which copy or which version of my data has been um, has been um, connected or shared with whom and which version has been possibly abused online right so to give you an example if uh, I share the same information about my account with Google, with Amazon, and with um, Facebook, and then Amazon, Google, and Facebook share this information with uh, uh, um, advertisement uh, company A, B, and C, and company B abuses uh, this information. I can go. Well, it was Amazon that sold my information to the company B, and company abused that information. So I can hold accountable Amazon for uh, abuse, like you know, transacting with an untrusted company. Although it was the same information, the version of it is watermarked in a way. Mm. And this is something that I think is extremely tempting. I'm not sure how, you know, put it in technical terms, but I think a standard around that when using blockchain for that is something extremely interesting and 
kind of brainstorming around on the uh, during the workshop of how to put it in good technical terms is very good. Also, it gives incentive to the big players, the companies, because now they no longer have the responsibility of um, take care of the, the data because they can transact based on accessing the data. So they don't they don't have to feel or they don't have to be held responsible uh, or accountable for taking care of the data. They can just take pieces of information from the user and not pack the data or the responsibility is much lower in that case because they can prove that this is, has been uh, abused. Got it. Um, very innovative. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, may I ask, um, oh, somebody just wrote, can I follow on that? Oh, that's Doug. Okay, great. The answer is yes, and I'll just make one quick observation, which is um, there was a company that um, that uh, collaborated with um, with research, uh, crypto research I'd done at MIT like 15 years ago, I think, and I'll dig out their name for you, but they had a patent on a kind of steganography that allowed for the sort of... Um, you know, basically unique, like just hiding little messages and unique versions of things like books and photographs and movies and other media objects so that you could tell kind of like which version of it under which contract or distribution agreement or something was the one where there was potentially an issue uh, with um, it, um, you know, being, um, you know, basically, you know, the kind of shenanigans that you're just talking about. Let me see if I can find that um, and I'll email it to you, but I have to say it was very fruitful and one of the issues I thought with um, using steganography other than the technical issues of needing enough data to hide it the messages in was really just having like some sort of public registry of uh, where you could um, you know publicly verify uh, you know what the versions were just a bit easier as opposed to have to necessarily take people to court and you know the enforcement of, of that was was not necessarily so easy uh, perhaps blockchain could uh, provide this sort of shared ledger where um, versioning of, uh, of, of, of property digital property could happen at scale and um, you know it could be more preventative dispute resolution or um, kind of enforcement perhaps much more efficiently um, as a result of the new capabilities of this technology so very um, inventive uh, ingenious idea there and I look forward to thinking more about that um, as we head toward the uh, workshop and yet yeah, Doug did you um, want to follow on yeah I, I... I, there were just two other things that might not be immediately obvious um, in terms of implications from uh, from what Marta was saying, and uh, one of them is your social media interactions. Um, the uh, a, a lot for marketing, and I know this is something people hate to think about or talk about, except people who are in marketing, but. Um, uh, being able to track the impressions that you have for, for your content um, uh, as it makes its way through the web is actually a really interesting uh, question and problem. Uh, information propagation uh, and, and then, then re-aggregation of results is actually really interesting. But for me, and, and, I, and I think that's actually quite interesting, I'd, I'd like to see uh, I'm always fascinated to see where things that I've written pop up and I'd like to see if there's some way of of that, of that, of making that um, uh, easier for people to do. Um, and yeah, we're actually, uh, Doug. We're actually working on that exact thing with a partner right now. Um, very, very, making sure that the ad exchanges don't have your, you know, too much of your data, and being able to understand one individual impression object as it makes its way from the the, the seller to the exchange to the purchaser and then to the eventual render so that we start getting a better handle on where all this stuff is going and who's ha who has it. Yeah, and, and along with that, uh, the problem of freebooting. Um, you know, somebody puts a video on YouTube and they actually make money off of ad impressions on YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people make a living off of just, you know, of, of, from creating content in a really uh, ad hoc way, and then somebody takes their video and uh, c 
cuts out the credits and puts it on Facebook and gets ten times the number of impressions, you know, ten times the number of views, impressions, I'm sorry, uh, gets ten times the number of views, but the person who made the content doesn't get compensated for that. And, and honestly, that's just not fair. I, I'd love to see a way for people to be compensated more for their contributions because increasingly, uh, we don't go through distributors for contributions. We uh, People manage it themselves, and I think that's a really powerful possible model for how people uh, make money in the future. And, and going along with something like that, if people can make a living by doing those things, uh, you know, if the, if the web can facilitate people making money in these ad hoc ways, there's actually less need for uh, ads and for collecting uh, privacy information because uh, it's because a website, you might pay a website directly. Now this isn't blockchain. This is sort of web payments stuff we're getting into. But um, you, you might pay uh, you know, a tenth of a cent to a, uh, to a website rather than see the ads. And then you don't have the ads. They get compensated, but you don't have the ads on your phone. It doesn't eat your bandwidth up. It's not annoying. Mm -hmm. But the, really thing, the thing I think is the most interesting and possibly the heavy, might have the biggest impact from what Marta is saying might have the biggest impact on the world is that scientists currently lock their data away because they're afraid of somebody using it um, and not giving them credit. Um, so a lot of really important studies are not, the data is not available on the web because uh, it is a credit-based, it's a, it's a merit-based uh, system, science is. Uh, you get grants and other things based on the things that you've contributed. And if somebody takes your research and reinterprets it in a different way, uh, they may well lock you out of the credit. You, you, you made the data, you did all the hard work, but they evaluated it or interpreted it a certain way, and they get credit for that, and, and the scientist might, uh, might, it might be afraid that they won't get the due credit. And so if data were some, if we were a way of watermarking and, and marking data and social expectations around that, um, we could have a, a renaissance of release of data on the web which could uh, revolutionize science. Yeah, I think one interesting thing there is, and that could help is, and I don't, I don't know for sure if this would be a solution, but um, to look at homomorphic encryption and saying, like, if you encrypted a container that contained a video and to play it, it was a multi. It was a, a multi-signature contract, essentially, just a regular Bitcoin transaction that would wrap it, where you had to pay into it, and it was tied to your blockchain identity. Um, then, you know, the only way to essentially have that container play its content would be to pay in and have it come from your identity. So that would, that might be one way to go about doing that. That would be interesting. It's it's hard because you always with like documents, you always suffer the problem of. If someone even paid in and to view something, I guess you could screenshot it, um, which is not as fun if it's like a video because then you end up with, you know, probably, you know, unless the person's really, really good and, you know, capturing the stream. But yeah, there's there's ways to do it, I think, that capture, like, value for the 99% of people viewing it that will actually pay and do the right thing. So yeah, I think we could, I think there's ways in that, that it can work into blockchain. Yeah. And um, so just I'm um, sorry to to deepen a little bit here. Your underlying your comment is a nice sense of identity and a sense of ownership, like together, right? Yeah. Uh, the it, it's important to know that the financial people who have really propelled much of the blockchain development thus far with the ledger, um, like traditional ledger uses, uh, have broken through um, from GAAP generally accepted accounting principles right to contracts, ownership, um, and ownership rights and exchange rights, and a few other legal concepts, and something called FIBO, of IBO, which is being um, advanced through Open Management Group um, and looked at um, very seriously uh, as a structured format that is um, that maybe the type of you know, primitive almost, where you you could put together between ownership, contract terms, uh, property rights, identity, a very very strong case for a web um, standard that could begin to put pieces together, so that people can track their property and exchange it without being ripped off. And I just want to ask you, Doug, in your next comment, if you could speak to 
a little hack that I've done with some students, which is um, we use archive.org for like almost everything now in our research projects. You talked about science and sharing. So here, an example is every day or every week example for me is you're putting data sets and other reports and other research copies of it on archive.org so we can find it again. And mm -hmm. I use the key value pairs um, that they just make available for um, metadata mm -hmm. on everything that you upload to archive.org for everything basically, you know, so that we can find, sort, filter, search, you know, use the provenance depending on the funder, whatever it is that we need. Key value pairs are very flexible. What if there was a way to back up my science and back up my media, maybe like containers along the lines that Daniel said, onto systems like archive.org um, and then what if the there's standard metadata to describe an address on a blockchain and uh, connect it back to either property type or a media um, object, a resource somewhere. It, could that be one of the ways that you could begin to put pieces together so that we've got, you know, locations where data can reside? I'm saying archive.org is an example of that on the web where I put my science. And then some is maybe standard metadata where there's a way to understand you have to connect a blo blockchain address a URL or something to where the data is, I think, and then also a more supple way to describe own identity and ownership rights um, so that we can get, begin to get the chains of provenance. If you could just think, you don't have to respond right now, we can respond at the conference, but I want to say that's what I was thinking a little bit as I heard both of you talking about this vision, um, and it's a very real everyday problem right now uh, for the sharing of results and not really being able to know, not just for attribution, uh, most of our stuff is free, but just to know who's working on what and just to be able to have buildable science. Uh, but anyway, I, 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 I interdicted you, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, you have the floor. I, I think what you said is really interesting. Discoverability is an enormous problem on the web. Uh, uh, tracking uh, where something came from, e even like all of these things are are, are big issues. Uh, as you said, identity, provenance, delegation, all of these things are larger issues. And I I want to say first off that I'm as guilty of this as anybody. At the workshop, we want to actually be more focused on the concrete things that would enable these use cases. These use cases are fantastic. This is what we want to be able to achieve. This is probably not what we're going to go in depth on at the workshop itself. I hope what the workshop does, I mean, if we had a workshop on HTML and we talked about all the things you could use HTML for, <laughs> that would be a very disorganized conference. Be a long um, workshop. <laughs> be a long workshop. Um, and so, I don't want to put people off and think, oh, this workshop is not going to be focused. Actually, we're going to be try, try to be quite focused at the workshop about concretely what are the pieces that we need to enable these use cases. And we were we were all going a little getting excited and thinking, oh, what could what could we do once we have these once we have this functionality from a standards perspective? I'm most interested in making sure that we can enable people to be creative and to do these sorts of things uh, on the web. And that's what we're really going to focus on at the workshop. Um, use cases are fantastic and they're aspirational and inspirational, but uh, coming, bringing it back down to is there a specific API? Is there a specific data format that we need to standardize? Is there a some piece of functionality that's client-side in a browser, some sort of wallet thing or uh, is there some something that we built into a browser, for example, yeah. that would enable uh, all these different use cases? That's uh, uh, that's the sort of uh, focus that I want to have at the conference. And now, just to get a little more, <laughs> jump back on our, 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 our use case, and I realize I, I'm cognizant that we're coming up on, on the top of the hour, yeah. but one thing I want to note about sharing data is in talking to scientists, Scientists, I found out that um, uh, uh, most data, perhaps, that's being shared is actually not on the web, not because they're concerned with it, uh, with who's using it, but because of the sheer size of the data and the and the complexity of well, and and just the bandwidth that it would require. They actually uh, physically mail hard drives, uh, FedEx, you know, they ship hard drives to one another, 
with data because we're talking about things on the terabyte scale. And I'm sure that there are that there probably are already, and that in the future there will be um, high bandwidth, high throughput, real time repositories, clouds for data that scientists use. Um, and in preparation for that technological infrastructure, having standards that help us describe and find that data and uh, uh, share that data in a meaningful way. When I say share, I mean share the information about the data. Obviously, you wouldn't want to put this data on the blockchain, right? You would want to put some sort of uh, pointer to this data, right? Um, and uh, on the blockchain, because the blockchain would quickly get way too big if you started putting real data on it. And a fingerprint. Um, but, and a fingerprint, yes. All these things. And so, this, these are all really interesting things, and I think that there's a lot to talk about in the coming months after the workshop as well. Uh, and that's the, uh, the last thing I want to say is, if this workshop goes well, if people at the workshop feel like, hey, maybe there could be some web standards about this stuff, rather than, if they think that it's timely, um, to start those discussions. Hopefully what we'll do is we'll form some sort of community group um, or use an existing community group um, at W3C perhaps or find other four elsewhere to keep these ideas going after the workshop and to keep this conversation going and to find what things are most fruitful and incubate those, get those to a state where we, we have general consensus and uh, confidence in the functionality and the functionality, you know, confidence that we got the, the big parts right. And uh, then we could actually talk about bringing those to standards. And so that's, that's part of the larger conversation that should happen after the workshop. The workshop itself is, is just to put the ideas on the table and just to come, to come to shared understanding about what might happen. And then in the months after that would be the time when we uh, really drill into that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me throw out a teaser to uh, you know so people can see stuff in action. But I, so I've been working on a web extension using the new web extension standard stuff to run across um, you know all the browsers that support it, Edge, uh, Chrome, Firefox, and right now we're we're gonna sub in the true peer-to-peer -peer ability soon. But right now I'm using one name's API. Um, but able to resolve in a browser tab when you put in like at dan.id, it will actually resolve against the blockchain identity and show you. A profile, the profile data essentially associated with that. So if it's a, a person object, it detects that schema and says, "Okay, I'm going to show like a like a person page in, in Chrome page," um, or it'll show like another Chrome template of you know an IoT device. It's device. It looks a little different. It's more modulated towards interacting with device. Um, and then we're going to be swapping out that API for the actual um, peer-to-peer endpoints soon. So. Very, uh, very quickly, you'll be able to see what it would be actually be like if you could look these identities up in the browser. And I should have that by the 28th, so um, so I can I can go show show people what that next layer of the onion might look like um, in practice. That's fantastic. That would be cool. Um, that is fantastic. Well, so some of the themes uh, that we kind of surfaced were you know, identity again. Um, Expressing ownership and provenance, um, something that can assist with exchange, a fair value exchange um, at scale, including individuals. We talked about the need to be really looking toward APIs, formats, you know, kind of structures of data, which is a, a sweet spot for a W3C, and um, and and other themes as well, some innovative ideas and use cases uh, that um, uh, that. Um, I hope that we'll be um, talking more about. And so that is uh, there's a little bit of a whistle wetter, I guess, to uh, as we as we get closer to the workshop. One thing I'd like to say is um, with Doug's help, I have created a page on the workshop site. Um, it, it's a forward slash feedback where you can see the ratings that um, Daniel referred to of the papers, and I just added in um, a form because we didn't get ratings from that many um, program committee members we got from um, quite a few and every paper was rated several times but if you're on a program committee and you happen to hear of this or 
if you check your email later today. Uh, it would be great to get even more of a show of like who thinks what is interesting as we get up to the workshop. So check out that feedback page. Just the uh, Doug. I mean, I'm reluctant to touch the workshop page itself, but if you think it's okay, maybe you could put a link to it to make it easier yeah, to find. Yeah, I, I, I'll put. A, I will. I will put a link to that on on the, on the page itself, uh, right in the section on the on. Uh, topics and in, uh, in position papers and, and expressions of interest. Awesome. And then who knows, maybe we can um, learn more about Marta's, I'm just going to say ingenious idea. Um, it's like peanut butter and chocolate putting, you know, individual ownership of, of personal data together with the vast global capabilities of the blockchain for public verification. And then maybe, I don't know, Daniel, if we can get a sneak peek of your thing, whatever, uh, bring it. So um, program committee members, um, collaborate and share and communicate. Um, I'd love to learn more as we lead up to the workshop so I, I and I'm sure other committee members as well can can bring our best game and really be considering what your ideas are. Yeah, I'll get it out by Wednesday. I'll try and get it out by, or Tuesday, I'm sorry. Oh, excellent. Okay, you heard it here. Uh, Tuesday, I'm going to put that in the blockchain. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so thanks very much, everybody. We look forward to seeing you uh, in person at the MIT Media Lab next week. And um, until then, Wishing you very well. So bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye, all. Thanks. Bye.